Okay. Uh, thanks for the chance to talk here. Um, so I'll just start with some motivation. So as you know, there's many different flavors of uh, analytic geometry. You have the piadic geometry. Um, uh, complex analytic geometry. Uh, real analytic geometry and all kinds of other fields that people might be interested in. Um, so each of these fields has a valuation. I'll discuss that soon. And, and also you just have ordinary algebraic geometry. Uh, so our philosophy is that we can think of all of these as special cases of relative algebraic geometry. But each of them has their own symmetric monoidal category that might be associated to them. So I'm going to explain geometry relative to a closed symmetric monoidal category with a bunch of other conditions. Okay, so that's the first piece of motivation is to um, make different kinds of analytic geometry look like algebraic geometry as much as possible. So there will all be special cases of this. And then the second part of the motivation is uh, produce theories of derived analytic stacks. So in the, um, the school part of this meeting, uh, we heard interesting lectures by Kalak and Sosinski um, on derived algebraic geometry. So, I mean, of course, including higher stacks. So, again, produce doesn't mean sort of re um, work too hard, but produce means find a language in which we can take derived geometry of uh, Lurie, Toyn, and Vizzozzi and um, kind of make it analytic by considering it with respect to one of these categories. And in also, uh, I'll just point out that in the lectures of the school by Joyce, Getzler, and, and Bolt, we heard about derived moduli spaces. So, and, and including analytic moduli spaces, which were mentioned probably in other people's lectures too. So derived analytic moduli stacks. So you have some moduli of objects and for various reasons you might want to think of it as an analytic moduli space as opposed to an algebraic moduli space. Sometimes two of these stacks are only isomorphic when you think of them analytically. But these appear in many different areas of mathematics, mere symmetry, uh, Konsevich has mentioned uh, non-Archimedean geometry. Also, Andrew McPherson, who's here, works on things to, to do with that. Um, even number theory with moduli of Galois representations. So there's a lot of motivation for kind of having a language where you can define these analytic uh, moduli stacks. And I should now say, of course, that all of this is joint work with Kobe Kremnitzer. And except for the end of this talk, everything is on the archive. And then I'll, at the end, I'll say some stuff that's not on the archive. So, I mean, our paper, our names are not so rare. So I, I don't remember the archive number, but you won't, you won't have any problem finding it. Uh, using our names. And, but actually, if you're interested in the paper, I'll, I can just send you a copy because I have a better version than what's on the archive. So I'll probably just start now with, um, with our approach to non-Archimedean geometry. So we, we wanted to test this philosophy out. And the testing ground that I'm going to use is a comparison to Berkovich analytic geometry 
But for all the stuff I'm going to say today, it's, you can think of rigid analytic geometry too and possibly some subcategory of Hubert geometry. What I'm going to say today is so general that it, you can take any of these theories and try to work with them. Um, so let me talk about non-Archimedean geometry as, as I see it. And then I'll try to view it as relative algebraic geometry. So Tate algebras. are kind of the basic building blocks. So we look at, oh, we start with the Tate algebra itself, which is basically functions that converge on a poly disk. So it's written this way. I'll define this thing. Um, as an algebra, it's just a subalgebra of the formal power series. And of course, it contains the polynomials. So x1, x1. And you can just view it, well, there's a few ways to think about it. You can think of it as the formal power series. Um, so, so f I'm gonna I can write as a multi-index notation, a to the i xi. Um, such that the limit of these guys goes to zero. I'll say it in a second. So this, I forgot to mention that I'm going to fix a field with evaluation. I'll, I'll say it now. So ri goes to zero. Okay, so I forgot to say what this is. So this is, so we have a field, k, uh, fix k, any field, with a non-Archimedean valuation. So this is r plus. So I made a list earlier. Um, the P addicts are an example of this, and also the formal Laurent series. And uh, I wanted this defines a metric, and I, I'm going to look at the case where it's complete with respect to the metric. Okay, so the, the, that explains these bars here. So these are the functions that converge at all points of the poly disk, and the poly disk is just sort of vector C, such that Ci, so C is inside k to the n, say, um, and Ci is less than Ri, or less than or equal to Ri. So that, that's the basic kind of thing, and now we take ideals inside there. So, uh, Affinoid algebra um, I'm going to think of this as a Banach algebra, um, which is just a quotient of this Tate algebra by an ideal. Actually, the Tate algebra is no theory, and so the ideal is finitely generated automatically. Okay, so I, forgot, I said a Banach algebra, so I should say what the norm is. So, so if I write a function like this, it's just the soup norm. A i x to the i is the soup of a i r to the i. So r r is just, I mean, this is multi-index notation. Okay, so r to the i is R1 to the I1, Rn to the In. Okay, so that's the basic building blocks, and there's a kind of Berkovich spectrum that people attach to these, but I don't, it's not really the main emphasis of the talk, so we can take the opposite category to these guys, and those are affinoid domains. Um, and now there's an important topology called the G topology on these things. So, well, 
What's nice is you can be extremely explicit about what you mean here. So say that A is one of these affinoid algebras. Okay, so we define, um, say, fix F1 through Fm elements in A and one more element, G in A, that generate the maximal, uh, generate all of A, sorry. And now you can define AV um, to just be a certain algebra that A will map to. Again, it has a residue norm. So I forgot to say, I mean, you, you equip this with the residue norm, and this, this will also be a Banach algebra. So I'm going to just adjoin variables, y, like similar to what I wrote before. So y1 through s1 uh, over s1, ym over sm, uh, gy1 minus f1, g, ym minus fm. Okay, so as an example, um, oh, sorry, just one second. Um, yeah, and g so geometrically this, geometrically, you can think of imposing these conditions, fi, is less than or equal to S I G. Okay, so if if I took um, example, I mean I'm cheating a little bit. So you might say imposing these conditions where, so you really you look at a space of semi valuations. Sometimes people write X, and then you look at those semi valuations which satisfy this property. Um, Okay, so I said I, I said I was going to talk about uh, relative algebraic geometry. So I need to interpret these as commutative monoids with respect to some symmetric monoidal category. So let me let me talk a little bit about just what is relative algebraic geometry, and then I'll give the I'll just mention the example of Banach spaces. Of course, I have to talk about what relative algebra is before I can get to relative algebraic geometry. But anyway, relative algebraic geometry. Okay, so I don't know the full history of who this goes back to, but uh, Deling, Hakim, but then the version that we actually paid most attention to was uh, Toen, Vitsotzi. And Antoine Vacquier, another paper. There's two different papers that you can look at. Well, also, Lurie should, I mean, probably appears here. <laughs> so let's say that I have, so, so say that relative means relative to a symmetric monoidal category. So let's, what is that? So uh, a symmetric monoidal category, just briefly, it's just a category with, an operation that looks like tensor product of vector spaces. So, um, it's it's a category along with an operation. Uh, oh, sorry, C cross C to which I'll just write like this, C, and it has an identity object, and it's equipped with. Um, I'm still giving the data, so it's equipped with associativity and commutativity uh, natural transformations. So I, I haven't yet gotten into all the axioms that they satisfy, but I'm not going to write all those down. So this is the commutativity natural transformation, and there's an associativity one. Um, oh, I should probably also say that there's this, there's these guys. Oh, 
Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll give examples soon. And then you say it's closed if this uh, functor has a, a, a right adjoint. So it's closed if um, you have another functor, just internal HOM. So I'm, I'm, I'm underlining that because I don't want to confuse it with the HOM in the category C, although they're always very closely related anyway, but just to not confuse things. So, and it's supposed to be an adjoint, so it means um, HOM of U, V, W, Okay, and now once you have such a category, you can define algebras that are kind of internal to the category. So an algebra, actually I should say com commutative unit of monoid to be precise. So com C. So the objects here are just uh, um, objects of C together with a morphism of course, pay attention that this means in C, of course. And this just forms a category of algebras. I mean, you, you impose all the obvious conditions. Okay, commutative associative unital algebras. And then, for any for any one of these, you can define mod mod a. Um, so the objects are just um, guys in C, and a map from A tensor M to M that satisfies all the obvious relationships of a module. Okay, so. Uh, um, the, the, the best thing that it implies is that the tensor product is right exact. So if I have a short exact sequence and I tensor, then it remains exact on the right. It's, things kind of, I mean, are, I think, kind of a pain if you don't have that, but it's not completely necessary to do a lot of the things I'm going to say, but it's, it's helpful. You could try to get away without it. Um, and now I, you want to define topologies on the opposite category to commutative monoids. So maybe I'll just use the notation in the future, um, lowercase spec, just to mean that I think of something in the opposite category. So lowercase is to sort of not give it very much respect. I just, it just means A, but thought of in, in the opposite category which are, is the category of affine schemes. And now we need to define a topology on this category. So we can define stacks, higher stacks, and things like that. Okay, so this also comes from, this actually comes from the world of derived geometry, this kind of topology, but it happens to work for us. Um, I need one more thing before I can define a topology, so assumption. Uh, C is quasi-abelian. So this is a notion of Jean-Pierre Schneider's. It's very similar to a quill and exact structure except it's a property of a category. It's not an extra structure, but you can kind of go back and forth. For a, you can get to a quill and exact structure if you want. Um, the, let me just mention, so, so C is going to be a closed symmetric monoidal quasi-abelian category. And I'll just, I'm not going to totally spell out the quasi-abelian homological algebra, but it gives you nice triangulated categories and um, derived functors. So the, the main way that I think about this is that you allow resolutions by strict morphisms. 
projective, say, resolutions by strict morphism. So um, strict, a strict morphism is just, a, you need a category with kernels and co-kernels, but you say that a morphism is strict in any additive category with kernels and co-kernels. Uh, strict if the kernel of um, E goes to the co-kernel of F. So these are, I'm using now the categorical notions of kernel and co-kernel is the co-kernel of the kernel of F mapping to E. Okay, so it's, a, it's kind of nice morphisms. So for Banach spaces, these are basically morphisms whose image is closed. And so you can define derived tensor products and things like that. That's the most important thing. You can define projective resolutions. Just one way to think about it, here's an example. I mean, if I have some objects, I'm, only, I'm not always going to identify this with the co-kernel. Um, I'm only going to identify it with the co-kernel uh, if f is strict. Okay, so if, I, if it's not strict, I'm just going to leave it exactly as it is. I can, I'm not going to identify it with co-kernel. So there's less relationships in the derived category than the ordinary derived category. So you only identify two complexes if the um, cone of the morphism between them is acyclic and strict. Otherwise, you just can't identify them. I mean, you, you do not invert. You only invert things whose cone is acyclic and strict. So, so now I can, I'll, I'll, I'll now um, use this quasi-abelian assumption to write down a kind of a version of a topology that appeared in the uh, work of Toen the Tsotsi. So this is kind of a quasi-abelian version of what they did. It's not, it's not literally what they did, but it's just a slight modification of it when you have a quasi-abelian setting. So, um, so let's see. Okay, so maybe first I should, let me see. Maybe first I should give some examples. So examples. So C is vect, and then you just get ordinary, say vector, vector traces of a field, you just get ordinary uh, rings and algebras and modules. And now the second example, uh, K is a non, like before, K is a non-Archimedean valuation field. The category is the category of Vonach spaces over K. And I should say what the tensor product is. So this is just a completed projective tensor product, which means um, it's the completion um, of the following norm. So on, on U, uh, so it, okay, so U, U uh, V is the completion of just the ordinary tensor product equipped with so this semi-norm, it's not a norm, uh, the norm of W is going to be the infimum of the maximum of all possible ways, so I have to write it as all possible ways as a tensor product. So that's ui times vi, where w is the sum from i goes from 1 to n of ui tensor vi. And then the internal hom is just the bounded um, morphisms it's wi with its natural structure as a Banach space. Okay, so now I can define the category, uh, sorry, the topology. So we wanted to find covers, um, Grothendieck topology. So um, so 
So A, A and B here are, A and the BI are in com of C, where C is a closed symmetric monoidal quasi abelian category. You also need projectives, but uh, let me not get into that. It works for Banach spaces, that's what's important for now. Okay, so the covers are um, collections of maps with the following properties. So that first of all, um, I want that BI tensor, that the derived tensor product over A, BI is isomorphic to B, to BI for all the I's. So this is equi this is a natural thing. I mean, this appears in many different areas of math. You can find it in complex geometry, various things. Uh, it's really equivalent to saying that the derived category of, um, of BI embeds fully faithfully into the derived category of A. So you can think of that as pushing forward sheaves. And then the second condition that I want is that you can detect isomorphisms by pulling back to the cover. So I want that any morphism of finite A modules is an isomorphism if and only if it's an isomorphism on after pulling back to each BI. So let's say that M to N, any morphism of finite A modules. There's various sort of variations you can do. There's like tons of different topologies you can define. The question is what, what do they restrict to for various symmetric monoidal categories? So this is the one that we were interested in to recover the G topology. So finite A modules is an isom if and only if it's an isom after tensoring with all the possible BIs. Okay, so if and only if um, M tensor BI over A. Yeah, sure, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, how am I doing on time? I don't know one time. Okay. Um, okay, so now I can say the theorem. Maybe I'll state it in two parts. Um, Um, so let A and B be alphanoid algebras. With respect to K, so alphanoids, like I just defined before. Then, so I didn't talk much about this Berkovich spectrum, but and there's a way to phrase this that doesn't use the spectrum, but let me just say, so you can think of it geometrically. Um, so earlier I defined rational domains. So I'll say that this is a finite union of rational domains, otherwise known as a subdomain, if and only if uh, this this condition holds when you use the completed tensor product and Schneider's kind of homological algebra. And then, so that's, that's the main part, but you have to do a little bit more work and then you prove that the G topology, so uh, let me say it this way, the abstract Toen, in this case the Tsotsi, although 
Toen Bucky also wrote about this topology. So now I'm going to say something about derived geometry um, on derived, derived, or say DG Banach algebras. And I mean, this is our interpretation of it, um, meaning the quasi abelian version. Quasi abelian version. If you restrict this to just things that are not DG, but just affinoids, um, restricted to affinoids agrees with the G topology. So this is a kind of test that it makes sense. It's a, it's a reasonable test for some theory of derived analytic geometry that you get back something reasonable um, when you put in things that are sort of non-derived. Um, agrees with the G topology, which is this thing sort of generated by uh, finite unions of rational domains. Okay, so I just really quickly say some future work. Um, or current work. Uh, So with uh, Federico Bambosi, who's a graduate student here, uh, we can extend this to dagger algebras, so current work. So you replace Bond by a bigger category. There, there's a few different things you can use. I won't. I won't get into too many details about the category. They're basically topological vector spaces with extra properties. Uh, but it, it's a category with all limits and co-limits, unlike Bond. And um, you get the theory um, of dagger algebras in their domain. So, uh, so say, and so you re and then you replace. Uh, these AVs that I was talking about by the dagger algebra, which is the germ of functions. Just informally, it's the germ of functions um, near your closed set V. So over convergent functions. This is V. You're going to look at functions that converge on a slightly larger open set. This is an important uh, work due to Gloss Clone. And in this kind of work by Federico, uh, we can treat the non-Archimedean and Archimedean cases completely uniformly, so uniform treatment. Of Archimedean and non-Archimedean. And then so you can get complex analytic geometry here. And then uh, one more thing, let me see. Oh, and then you can define a model category on simplicial, uh, simplicial objects in C. So simplicial objects in C are also quasi-abelian. So there's, um, it's due to Christensen and Hovey. There's a model category on simplicial objects in C. You can use their definition of the model category, or you could take complexes in C and thereby getting sort of derived geometry. Um, and so then since the, I just want to add, since, the, since one of the themes of this conference is algebraic analysis, um, this, this whole theory uh, works well if you want to think about infinite order D modules. So there's work of Ardakov and Wadsley On, on infinite order D modules. But we can reinterpret this work in a different way, which I like better. Um, and this way is also due to Schneider's, so Schneider's. So basically you can define D as HOM of O to O in the correct category. And you can, you can also do this over other fields. 
So you can try to do the same thing over other fields. Okay, I'll end there. Thanks. <laughs>